Welcome to Developmental Psychology Unit 4 on Emotional Development. I like discussing emotional development right after physical development because emotional development starts off with a really strong biological basis, more so than even cognitive or social development. So we're going to start off talking a lot about the biological underpinnings of emotional development. And then as we move along through this unit, you're going to really see how emotions, cognitions, and social skills really blend together as we develop, further reinforcing what we talked about in unit one about how physical, emotional, cognitive, and social development really truly can't be separated, even though we're artificially separating them for the purpose of this course. So there's five main topics we're going to discuss, and we're going to jump right into the first one, which you may be somewhat familiar with, the idea of temperament. So there's lots of different theories of temperament, and one theory in particular I like to focus on for this course is the theory by Thomas and Chess. And this is a theory that temperament is biologically based. It's something we can start to measure and start to experience very early on, right after birth. So in extremely early infancy, we can start to see temperament emerge. And temperament's really described as these consistent patterns of behavior. Now there's lots of different schools of thought on exactly how to define temperament. But once again, I really wanna focus on Thomas and Chess's idea that temperament, much like personality, can be considered a bunch of different traits. And these traits are on a bit of sliding scales or dimensions or spectrums that we can think about. And they actually consider temperament to be made up of a combination of these nine possible traits. So what are these nine traits? Well, they are activity, persistence, attention, affect, reactivity, rhythmicity, adaptivity, approach, and sensitivity. That's a mouthful. We're gonna go through all nine traits, but we're gonna see there's actually quite a bit of overlap, and I've color-coded these as such, with dimensions that are somewhat related being represented here in similar colors. So we're gonna start off with the one that is very particular on its own, and that is activity. This dimension of temperament is the idea that some of us are just hardwired and biologically more active than others. And this starts off even before we're born. We can often see this when we're still in the womb. Some of us as fetuses kicked and moved all the time versus some of us barely ever rolled over. And this tends to be very consistent. We know that three-year-olds that are very highly active tend to go on to be the teenagers that are highly active, who tend to go on and be the adults that are highly active. Activity is also sometimes referred to as surgency in the academic literature, with people who are higher in surgency just being more active and more movement-based. At the extreme ends of this distribution or the spectrum, you can see how the very, very, very tail ends of the extremes both could be negative. We could have someone who is exceptionally hyperactive and someone who is exceptionally sedentary. It makes sense that a moderate or a high moderate level of activity is probably what's beneficial for us. So that is one attribute we can see in newborn infants right away. Another attribute we can definitely see right away is rhythmicity. This is how on schedule we are. In early infancy, this is the idea, do we work like clockwork? Do we sleep the same amount every night, get hungry around the same time of day, fill our diapers around the same time of day, and etc.? Or do we tend to be a bit more spontaneous? Also, how do we respond to shifts in our schedule? If you have a young infant and you have to go to a doctor's appointment during the regular nap time, are they going to be flexible and adaptive to that? Or is that something that they're going to be extremely fussy and extremely burnt out by bumping their nap time even a little bit? So rhythmicity is really how much of a schedule we're on, with some people being on no schedule whatsoever. They're completely random. They sleep at different times each day, they eat at different times each day, and this is really hard in infancy because parents don't know what to expect, and every time an infant cries, they don't know what it could be. Versus someone on the other extreme is going to be so rigid and, and just, they're gonna be on a very strict routine, even so much so that they might be extremely rigid and doing any modifications to that routine might become very costly to the parents. As we move on into childhood or adolescence, we can see rhythmicity play out a bit differently. The more spontaneous individual is someone who's going to be very hungry at different times of night. Maybe they're poking their nose in the fridge in the middle of the night. Maybe they have a hard time sticking to a sleep schedule versus the overly rigid person. They may become someone who really is uncomfortable when things are shooken up. So rhythmicity is one that we often only focus on in infancy, but we can see patterns as we go forward through the lifespan. A third dimension of temperament, as considered by Thomas and Chess, is the temperament of affect. Now this isn't how strong your emotions are, but this is how pleasant or unpleasant your emotions are. 
And this is the idea that dispositionally, some of us are just more happy. Some of us see sunshine and rainbows, where some of us see doom and gloom and dark clouds and windy rain. And so this is the idea that even as young infants, some of us wake up on the good side of the crib or the bad side of the crib. And it's true, some infants just wake up cooing and giggling versus others are always screaming. We can see that perhaps an infant who is experiencing colic, for example, may be in a more negative mood. As we move on to childhood and adulthood, there's some people who are just more optimistic and cheerful and other people that are just more negative. Aside from anything situationally happening, their natural disposition is to be more upbeat or more downbeat. As compared to affect, we also have the temperamental dimension of reactivity. This is not whether the emotions are pleasant or unpleasant, but more so how salient or how strong or how potent one's emotions are. And so this is really the intensity of our emotions and how much we react to things. And so you could have a person who's very positive or very negative who is also very intense, or you could have a person positive or negative who's very dull. And so what we're really seeing here is some people, if you look at these smiley faces, you might have someone who their mood is just kind of hovering in that gray level, more neutral. If they get a present, they're like, oh, thank you. If they break their cell phone screen, they're like, oh, darn. If they're struggling with a the puzzle, they're like, oh, gee. Versus you might have someone who has a high level of reactivity, in which case they really pivot between the extreme highs and the extreme lows. The crests and troughs in their emotional meter are much more extreme to the, to the extent of which if they get a present, they're like, oh, a present for me? And if their cell phone breaks, they're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this happened. Or if they're struggling with a puzzle, they're like, ah, ah, how do I do this? and they're much more expressive. So you can really think of reactivity as almost a degree of expressiveness in an individual. Moving on to some other dimensions of temperament, we also have attention. This is also sometimes called soothability. And this is how long an individual can lock on and hold their attention on something. Not something particularly challenging, just something more enjoyable or more passively. And so we have right from infancy, some individuals who are very locked on. They can watch things for a long period of time. They can listen to stories for a long period of time, where this others really can't. This has some perks and some detriments in a way you might not expect. For instance, infants tend to be very fascinated with things that are new to them, including things that they are not safe interacting with. Let's say there's an infant who really wants to touch a hot coffee pot and they have a high degree of attention. They can really lock their attention on. They might be reaching out for the hot coffee pot. You pick them up, you put them in another room, but they're so focused on that coffee pot, they crawl all the way back. So you put them in the bedroom, you put them down for a nap, they wake up after the nap and immediately they somehow remember this hot coffee pot and they go back to the kitchen trying to play with the coffee maker. This would be a problem if somebody was so stubborn and so in this one track mind that they wanted to play with an electrical socket or something sharp or something chokeable. In comparison, an infant who has a low amount of attention is also considered to be a highly soothable infant. And this is the infant that if they're going after the hot coffee pot, you just need to jingle some keys or put a new toy in front of their face or turn the television on. And all of a sudden they forget the coffee pot even exists and they're happy to change their attention or to change the channel. So we can almost think about a high degree of attention is the less soothable infant who has their channel focused on one thing versus the infant who is more distractible is also more soothable. We can, of course, see that at one end, you're gonna have a very stubborn person who may be hard to dissuade or distract, but at the other end, you might actually have people who are extremely attention deficit and have a hard time keeping track or even listening to the simplest of short stories. Now we're halfway through the nine dimensions of temperament. The next one we'll talk about is similar to attention, but different. And this is persistence, also known as perseverance. And this isn't so much how much you can keep your mind on one channel, but how much you will try at a challenging task. So this is the idea that if you're put in front of a challenging puzzle, or if you're trying to undergo a challenging physical achievement or a challenging academic achievement, do you give up pretty quick and ask for assistance? Or do you keep trying? And again, we can measure this right from infancy. We can see this in little infant board games or little infant puzzles. If we try and get them and their fine motor skills are not quite ready yet to rotate puzzle pieces of the ones with little pegs and you put them in the different shapes, if they're not quite ready to do that on their own, do they sit there and keep trying for a little bit? Or do they quickly deduce, I can't do this, I need to ask for help. 
Now, some individuals have just a good assessment of their ability and they can quickly say, oh, I'm not going to get this today. I'll do something else. And they're content to move on. Other individuals are saying, oh, I want this. I can't do it. And they become very upset. Either way, those individuals are showing low persistence. They're not trying to build the skill up. They want to wait till the task becomes easier. Versus we see other infants and other children and other adults who they are facing a challenge and they are okay trying something they're not good at because they're more so about learning things than at succeeding things. This is something that modern generations have struggled with in a more well-noted and well-cited way. We tend to like things we do well and we tend to dislike things we don't do so well. Aside from attention and persistence, we also have the dimension of approach. And this can really thought about as an infant dimension of extroversion or introversion. What we see here is right from birth, some infants are looking to make eye contact. They're looking to do social smiles and coo at other people. They want to see faces more. They want to interact more versus other infants are content to look at mobiles and shapes. Also, if you take them to a large family gathering, some infants are really fine being in the room with other people and hearing the voices, being passed around the room, interacting and crawling or waddling up to other people versus other infants would be very startled in the situation and not want to be around new people. And so on this scale, we might see some infants that are extremely, extremely withdrawn and they only want to be around the most familiar of their caregivers versus other infants tend to be a lot more social and a lot more interested in what's going on in the room. Next up, we have, again, a similar and overlapping dimension, what we call adaptability. And this is less about social adaptability and more so just about novelty in general. We know that adaptable infants might also be more social, but they might also be more interested in going to new places, eating new foods, trying new games, experimenting with new toys. You can also see how this might overlap with rhythmicity. And so what we have here at one level is if you take the infant to a coffee shop and they're just, there are new smells and new sounds and new sights, how do they react to that? Are they okay with that? If you give them a new toy or you bring home a new pet or they get a new brother or sister, how do they respond to these changes? Versus are they going to be very closed up to this? Are they going to panic? Even when it's something pleasant but new, like a new toy or a new fun experience, how will they do with novelty? And the final dimension of temperament, again, is in this green color, so it overlaps, is the dimension of sensitivity. And so this is the idea, not so much about emotional sensitivity, but about sensation and perception sensitivity. We know that some individuals, they can sleep with the television on and the lights on and people talking in the next room, and they have no problem with that. Versus other people want absolute darkness and absolute quietness. And we tend to see this in infants too. There's some babies you can put down for a nap and you can have the TV on, you can be cooking and clanging pots and pans, and it's totally okay. Versus there's other infants where you literally have to tiptoe around the house in the absolute darkness in order to get them to settle down for a nap. We also see this when it comes to digestion or the sensitivity to new foods in the system. Adaptability might be how we emotionally react to the idea of new foods, but sensitivity is how our body reacts to the idea of new foods. And if we can handle the transition from breast milk to formula or formula to solid foods, et cetera, et cetera, or if it's going to give us a lot of pain in our tummies. And some babies are just more sensitive to that than others, which then of course can feed off and influence their adaptability and the rhythmicity and their approach. So these nine dimensions of temperament can really help us to describe the individual differences in infants right from the get-go. And although we can use temperament to describe our personality as we get older, we tend to not use this construct. We tend to use more modern theories of personality. And pot personality tends to more so emerge around age five. And we tend to be able to measure things like the big five factor, the hexaco traits in children that are ages five and up. 